Did you know, on this day in 1963, April 7th, Jack Nicholas won the first of what would be six Masters Championships and go on to be well, the leading man when it comes to the game of golf, really. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Sunday Morning Show, again from the beautiful Perrinporth Golf Club. I've been invited up here today because Nathan has got a little course inspection with their golf course architect. There's going to be some subtle changes potentially going on around this golf course, as Nathan kind of alluded to in the last Sunday show we did with him. And whenever there's an opportunity to catch up with a golf course manager, a greenkeeper, or even, which is very rare, a golf course architect, I'm all up for coming down and spending some time with them. So I thought today we'd have a course inspection, walk around the golf course, let the guys play, let the guys chat, and let's get some information out of them as to exactly what is going to be happening here at Perrinporth Golf Club. That's the one. Oh, looking, looking good. There, there you go. go. There we go. Will you say you're more of a morning person or a night owl? Because you've got me up very <laughs> early to come out here and it's very fresh. I'm fast asleep usually by sort of half ten. Hey, <laughs> yeah. You like to get out and get going. Yeah. Well, why would you not when it's like this? Oh, absolutely right. I couldn't agree more. So, so tell me, Nath, what is the objective? What are the plans that you guys have got? I know you alluded to a few of those plans um, previously and talking about the aesthetics of the golf course, but what are the sort of major plans then, shall we call it, when it comes to the layout of this golf course? Because you don't just bring in an architect no. for no particular reason, you know? No, I mean, uh, Tim absolutely loves this place um, okay. and he came down and actually played it. Tim Lobb is the, the golf course designer, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, so he's, he's quite a, a famous architect, he's done a lot overseas, a um, okay. little bit in this country as well. Um, he came down and he just absolutely fell in love with the place and I mean, why would you not? Yeah. It's not a case of going and blowing it up and redesigning a golf course no it's a completely natural golf course so we don't really want to go and change and, and lose the, the the sort of the ethos of that what it is is in terms of refinement so is it a case that a pathway we can hide so it's not a visual aspect so like this tee box that we're on here is very natural in terms of it's on a little area on the golf course rather than say this big massive square tee boxes which have maybe been built over in the past it's just little bits like that that we're going to have a look through with tim as well as potentially some areas that maybe where we could soften a slope but still not ultimately change the, the sort of character of the golf course so not necessarily working let's say with the playing surface of the golf course no and again you mentioned it um a month ago when i was down here sort of saying that it was more the aesthetics of the golf course yeah and it, it, it's things like i don't want to see a path i don't want to see tee boxes and greens so close together so like this is obviously a very old design where everything's designed to be very close yeah. because people don't want to walk very far yeah. but actually when you're looking at it from a playing point of view and you've got somebody stood on a tee and then you've got somebody stood on a green and they're within 10 yards of each other that maybe that's something that we could look at and then obviously between the two there's also a path yeah. it's like well actually could we could the path go the other side of the tee and then suddenly you've got this bigger space and it looks much better from a from a golfing point of view it also then helps rob in terms of a rob being your course golf, manager right golf so course, so yeah. rob's, rob's my course manager and, and that then enables him to spread the wet yeah so where everything's concentrated in sort of a 10 15 yard area yeah. actually suddenly then it's in a 25 30 yard area so then you reduce that wear reduces his labour cost reduces his cost over time as well yeah. but also looks much better from a from a golfer's point of view This is one thing that I would stick on a list and I would go and I'd get some and I'd just this just lift all this. Just probably strip the turf. Make it the same and, level. And, as li it. and lift it a little bit. Yeah. You put six inches of sand in there, you alleviate that challenge. Because you can see it just dips. Yeah. yeah? And that's why. So so you've got the sand there, come right. in, just strip it. And look, because you see you've got these little tufts of foreign grass is coming in. Do you know what that's happened from? 
Yeah. It's from. It's, it's, it's because it's so it's wet. Cold, yeah. Yeah. Just listening to them already, the eye for detail is already starting to come through. And it's something simple, like here on the first, which is their tenth, they've got a, a small little, like almost like a little valley here, as it's kind of worked up over the years, I suppose, maybe. Um, and what Stuart's picked up on there is the fact that that valley has created a natural path for people to want to walk across which then it creates basically wear and tear in that particular area. You can see how much darker it is there compared to further up here. And even the green stuff wanting to kind of leave that area a little bit longer um, to help with that wear and tear. And what Rob's done is he's kind of tried to mark it off a little bit to stop people walking down there. But what Stuart's saying is just, just raise it, take out that little valley, bring it kind of more in level or more in keeping with the rest of the fairway. And then it might push people kind of to spread their wear just a little bit more but unfortunately it is a bit of a shortcut and a direct route up to the right hand side of the green which is kind of taking you then to the next tee but just a small little detail one of which I would have just walked straight past and you guys would have walked straight through um, just something small like that might just help aesthetically make the course just a little bit more pleasing my main aim at you know, as a course manager, it's the wear areas, the pinch points. So yeah. if we can, like we talked down the 11th, if we can eliminate some of them to spread the wear, I always feel as a course manager, you try and get it in the best condition you can. Yeah. And like we'll go up in a minute at the 12th and you see a muddy path beside the green. I don't want that. No. If we can have three options, I can move the wear. Yeah. I mean, wear's a problem for every course. And that's my objective. And as well as the turf, is. I believe links, all links, should you should be driving the fine the fescue. Yeah. Because it's unique to the British Isles. Yes. And that's my aim to get as much as that to keep pushing that. And you know, th and that means your height to cut have got to be a bit higher. But that's I think the romance of Parent Paul. If people come here, you know, because you can go to a say a modern links that's shaved down meadow grass. You can find meadow grass inland yeah. in America. But yeah. you can't find find fescue no. so that's my objective and i think it fits with the marketing and everything so you're not necessarily looking at major changes moving dunes putting bunkers in taking bunkers out you're looking at more how can we get the traffic moving yeah in a way that's not going to damage the golf course um as much i think so because i think perron porth is perron porth love it or hate it we don't want to lose our identity if we move away from that, I just don't think we've got a product at all. Because um, we're un unique, we need to keep it unique. So like what I say, there is blind shots, but you know that when you come to Perrinpore, as long as you inform people of that and maybe give them some guidance of where to aim, I think that is what people love. The people that love Perrinpore, that's what they love. So when you're going to other Lynx golf courses, yeah. as a good, good player yourself, yeah. county player yourself, yeah. are you always keeping an eye out? Yeah. Do you look at what other... Not, well, not even just links courses, but do you keep an eye on what other golf courses, other course managers are doing around the country? Yeah, no, totally. The biggest thing that I do since I've gone here, I attend the Irish Links Initiative. Right. Basically, Ireland lost its way, maybe the 80s, 90s, when irrigation came in, fertiliser. They started maintaining these courses, like I said earlier, and they lost all the fescue. Right. So the Americans stopped coming because oh, right. they've got that in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they've reversed the Irish Lynx Initiative, which is amazing. Their yeah. objective is fescue. Yeah. And they've embraced that. So I go to Ireland because I get all the knowledge off the Irish lads. Yeah. Because in you know not being snobby, but in this country now we haven't got many courses like us that I can get information off. Okay. You know England lost its way a little bit. It's, it's getting better. Yeah. And even Scotland to an extent, there's not many courses that are pure fescue. Right. Swords, where in Ireland there are, and that's where I get my inspiration. Tim, is there a way that that hollow, or the, the flat bit, can be made into a little bit wider, and that we actually start the fairway at the top, near where the marker post is in the top of that path, and then run it down into the hill? So it also then exposes, because remember when we played, Stu, and you you walked over yeah, the hill yeah, and you saw the natural rolling yeah. contours. Well, yeah, the path. But if we can get it to, the, and you run down into that, rather than what you get when you get a strong southwesterly wind, and they're in this, they're in this mounding here on the right. They can't get over. The average golfer sit here, so the white's there, 
we have to put the whites here. If it's a strong southwesty day, and the old boys are just caught in this this mound here. There's two things. One is, are they playing off the wrong tees? Well, even if they go right at the front, yeah. and it's into Provide. the wind, and they can't yeah, reach. That's what I mean, but are they, should there be another set of tees for the people that can't do that? But where do we put them? A lot of par threes for, for, for the ladies' course. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, so they got, they got two extra par threes. And um, is it because of the dunes that, that they have to go over? Or yeah, so obviously that the, kind of the issues? That yeah, the, right so if, if you were to play off, say, the front of the, the yellows yeah. um, to reach the fairway, if they get it into a strong prevailing wind, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's quite an intimidating tee shot. It's an intimidating tee shot for, for the men as well. Yeah. But obviously when they hit it that slight lesser distance, yeah. some of them will, it, it, that's why then basically they put it in as a par three. So it used to be a par four years ago. I was gonna say, Rob, was it always was it always a par three or was it was it? Yeah, I've, a par I've four? only known it as a par three from there right, in, okay. in my time. But I think there's plans of it that it once was a par four further back. Right. Possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. So we've got this natural dune position here, and you're talking now about possibly redirecting it's, it's just an exploring a different option and yeah. present it to the ladies and say, look. This is a, let's go out, let's have a look at it together. What do you think? Let's yeah. get their length, a nice short par four here. would be a lot nicer to play than a par three. Yeah, par three's tough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Par threes are really tough, yeah. Especially when it's like 180 up par yeah. three. So I'm just walking off the path, and this is kind of where Rob and Nathan are kind of thinking, is flattening out a spot here. Just a natural, well, a natural dune just, just here, beautiful view. And then you make a par four that kind of, there's the ladies tee, current ladies tee, which is just a short par three, but then you make a par four that kind of, a subtle dog leg around this sort of dune complex here. It kind of feels like it's quite natural already, kind of working out towards the sea, which is stunning. It looks like one of those like infinity fairways and then works its way up towards the green but like Nathan's just pointing out there you know this this green is a it's got a massive mound in the middle of it so it kind of runs up from the front up to the flat part in the middle and then drops off again at the back and it's a tough shot for a long par three which is probably what a lot of ladies would be hitting lots of woods in there you could actually get a decent tee shot away and be left with sort of a, a, a short to mid iron in making that hole just a little bit a little bit nicer for them for sure could just sort of go up, yeah. up in the up in the like there. You could have it so that the ball comes down. Couldn't be a bad thing. Tim, this is a, a delight to have the opportunity to spend mm. some time with you today because this is a fantastic, fantastic location. But one of the things that Rob and both well and Nathan have, have talked about is managing wear and tear on the golf course. Yeah. And like a lot of Lynx golf courses. Perrinporth very much has these pinch points, doesn't it? Mm. Where trying to work the traffic into certain points from the greens to the tees, it's difficult. Yeah. And this is a prime example here, isn't it? Yeah, Another I think it, it's really tricky because it's, uh, especially here at Perrinporth, it's pretty, um, pretty severe land. It is, yeah. <laughs> uh, which is, which is a, a blessing uh, for, for the golfing visuals and the, and the golfing experience, but a little bit of a curse for getting people around because we're really restricted on, on how people will walk. Yeah. And, and and people are a bit like sheep. They have a they have a direction they like to go. Yeah. Um and, and they've probably been walking the same way. So what, what we're trying to do is provide alternate routes. Um people do like to take the, the straight line approach, uh no matter if they almost twist their ankle or whatever, but um you know, give alternate alternate routes, gives the, 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 the green keeping team a chance to move things around, um, you know, and, and, and provide those exceptional turf qualities all year round. Yeah. And that, that's the challenge. And, and that's, that's what golf clubs aspire to. That's what members think they should have every yeah, day. Absolutely. Uh, it's not that easy, uh, guys and members, but um, you know, that's some of the some of the tactics that we'll be looking at and, and yeah. working towards. And if we take this spot here, yeah. Okay. And I know you guys have been discussing it just, you know, <laughs> off the cuff, should we say. Yeah. But what what you know, this is the only real area that anyone can kind of meander yeah. past this green 
and up to the next tee. What 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 what's the idea here? Could there be an idea here of, of trying to, yeah, trying to so, work it? So so what you're trying to do here is sort of broaden the area where people can walk. Um, if you can provide an alternate route, but in this location we can't put a T, you know, any further left because it's a steep, steep fall off. So thinking about how this could be broader, move people around a bit more, uh, is really going to help this situation. Yeah, and and talking about maybe even just sort of softening this here, making it slightly yeah, wider. Is that uh, a yeah, slightly wider? It's actually because people have been walking down there so long, it's actually lower than the green, so okay. it is a low spot, so we need to bring that up as well. And that's what causes a lot of, uh, let's say, pooling of water there as well? Yeah, exactly, the, the, the water will gather in the low spot there, so we're going to try and get that up and, and uh, yeah, make it wider and, and um, not low. One thing that I notice a lot, certainly in the UK, are these sort of shell paths. Yeah, but then I was playing at I think it was Bally Bunyan. Yeah, and even Raw Liverpool. Yeah, they've they've done away with these yeah. paths. Yeah, and they've made they would have made this area a flatter area, let's yeah. say. Yeah, uh, wider. Yeah, and they would have put in some more hard wearing grass. Yes. In there. Yeah. So maybe a mix of probably fescues, but they've got some stuff in there that is more hard wearing, and it blends in beautifully amongst the dunes. So, ba that, so basically, that, yeah, all the top thing? all the top links is now putting in the grass paths. And a lot of these are predominantly hardware rye grasses um, and tall fescues, things like this that can deep root, take the wear. But the downside of the grass paths, they look stunning. The maintenance, because when I went to Bally Bunyan, it's superb. They've nearly got a greenkeeping team, like of six guys, just maintaining these paths. Wow. Because it's football pitch turf, basically. So you're cutting it three times a week, you're fertilizing, you're coring, you're sanding, you're spending money on water. So although it's lovely, is it really sustainable? I agree with you, I think it looks stunning, but it's, um, it comes at a cost. Oh, yeah. Is that where you want to take it? Yeah, yeah, we're going over there. Just wandering down with Nathan because he's gone a little left off the tee and I've just come across, yeah, I've just come across a path. And we're just talking to Rob there about paths and this kind of rubberized path method that was brought in I want to say golf courses started putting it in maybe 10 years ago. I remember them kind of going in. And the idea of this path was obviously it has holes through the middle of the, the rubber. And you would put a hard wearing grass underneath it. And then the grass would then grow up through the, the mat. And you could, actually, you could actually cut it. You could kind of go over the top of it and cut it. But you can see here now that there's no grass anymore. It's now weeds that have gone, gone in there. And I was talking to Rob about that because I was quite interested to see these paths because there's a few around this golf course and there's a few around like Churston where I'm, I'm based as well. And what happens is this rubber gets so hot in the summer, just the black absorbs the heat and it kills off any grass underneath. So what you end up with is just then loads of weeds kind of growing through and then patches of grass kind of growing through. So it's kind of one of those methods that maybe looks quite nice when it first goes in but after the first kind of summer going through, you start to get that sort of burning effect underneath and then you end up with, well, it's not particularly nice on the eye, is it? Shut up. So what he's done at Greg's done at Ross and George's, he's in the high wear areas, he's roped them off and just put mats down in them yeah, okay. for people to hit off. Yeah, but I that's see. during the winter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But areas yeah. like this, yeah. you've got to give a chance to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. So we've got a general manager, Yep. A course manager and a course designer. Yeah. You are <laughs> legacy golf advisors. Yeah. But your background very much all about managing golf courses. Yeah. Club management. Club yeah. management. Club management. And now we got an advisory partnership where, you know, essentially we support clubs, we advise clubs, we consult with clubs. Um, consultancy in golf is a, is a funny uh, funny perception actually but actually what we say is we are we have the experience we have the expertise and probably most importantly we've got the proven track record okay we've been there and done that yeah um, you know as a partnership you know the, the experience we've got is you know arguably unrivaled so you know there are no issues that we won't have encountered somewhere before and you know if if, if we haven't then 
we've got a network through you know 25 plus years in the industry of that we can call on yeah and that's really an, an unfair play to parent uh, it's been wonderful working with them they've listened the, the, the board has listened Nathan listens it they ask questions and you know I think that's one of the things of wanting to get better um, you know you, you you speak to people and you, you consult with people that that have been there and done that and have been through it it's yeah. the same in any you know scope of life more than anything he's gone right at it got to get lucky oh the hoover you know fundamentally the game of golf is about having fun uh, you know, and, and especially where we are now in 2024 is that participation golf is huge, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely um, huge, yeah. Off the golf course. So your golf is, is, is changed a lot. And, you know, actually I see my job and, and my remit is to create environments where people from elite level, scratch, better pros, can enjoy the same game as someone who's trying it for the first time yeah. and that's the beauty, beauty of golf it really is this is a James Braid design golf course if you ask anybody who designed this golf course James Braid yeah but actually back in 1924 the first routing of this golf course was by a local amateur mm. by the name of uh, Mr. T. Knoll mm. James Braid then came down in the in the um, November so that was done in the October he came down in the November and he kind of gave it yeah, the thumbs up yeah, it's kind it of really what happened tweaked it a bit and massaged it a bit right but, uh, but his name goes down as the as the design is that yeah. normal well i guess he did what 400 courses or something yeah he couldn't have he couldn't have drawn them all out drawn them all or back them in those out. days yeah. if you were taking the train down and uh, yeah sure you know I, I i'm sure he was involved with with uh, with the the evolution of the course Right, and his vast knowledge of you know so many different courses and and you know what it took to build a course. I mean, it, it is a strange one. I guess it still does happen in 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 society now, where uh, golf course architects might be worked on and involved by a few different parties. Uh, so so nothing much has changed. I think <laughs> over history that the the famous ones uh, obviously their name will will endure and and keep the legacy which is which is fine um, you know as you say it is nice you know other people have been involved with this course um, throughout history uh, and I'm sure other you know in the next hundred years more people might be involved in it uh, so yeah it does happen uh, a lot foot and a half further oh, no. Close, it? stone dead but that is Perrinporth right there. No, but that I love. I don't think that's unfair. No. I could have taken a soft option like Nathan, but I didn't. <laughs> so I feel like I've got an insight from the objective from Nathan. I feel like I've got what Rob wants to kind of get from yeah. this golf course from a wear and tear point of view. Tim's given his input into, you know, how he could change things about. From your side of things, how do you then get this across the line with the powers that be of the membership? Yeah. You know, helping the board, helping people like Nathan get that story across. Yeah, it's the million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, you know, for, for me, it's, it is quite simple. It's a case of where are they now? Yeah. Where do you want to be? How are you going to get there? Yeah. And, you know, we, we do similar work with a lot of clubs when we take insights data member surveys if you want to, but but actually we're quite specific in what they are because anyone can go get a survey and it's it's what you do with that information because something i will say is that it's the silent majority that count not the vocal minority yeah yep and what happens too often in golf clubs is the more vociferous element yep influence decisions too much you shouldn't do that you need to use the, the data the insight so get get understand where you are yeah. yep understand realistically where you want to be what your budgets allow yeah and then build that plan so you know that that's something we're doing and, and it, it is strategic you know I try to go away from using strategic plans because people think it's a bit corporate and it's a bit too in-depth almost like scares them exactly it, yeah. it becomes an action plan yeah. so actually what what we are we will do out of sort of this period now is we will look to put together a two to three year action plan 
for Nathan, for Rob, for the club of yeah. where they want to be in that period of time. Right. And, and, and that time scale is about right because, you know, it, Things change. Yeah, things can change over periods of time, as we've seen. So just have something more specific, slightly shorter time frame where you can action stuff. Yeah. Well, that was fascinating. Like I said at the beginning of this video, having any opportunity to spend time with experienced people golf course architects, people that have been doing this for a number of years and listening to their thoughts, seeing things that they're seeing is always, I think, a fantastic learning curve for someone like me who's always trying to learn as much as I possibly can, certainly about greenkeeping, certainly about golf course architecture. And just seeing the way the guys kind of bounced off each other was so, so good. It's just a blank canvas, you know, putting their ideas down on there to see what's going to work the best. And as Rob quite rightly said, you know, he's just trying to manage this golf course. He's trying to manage the wear areas of this golf course. And Perrinporth certainly has some of those pinch points, as you'll see on lots of Lynx golf courses. I think the story about Perrinporth is quite unique, isn't it? You get those blind tee shots, you get those quirky bounces, of which you get at the old course at St Andrews. So you have to almost expect it when you come and play a beautiful Lynx golf course like this one. Fantastic to speak to Nathan, great to meet Stuart, great to spend some time with Tim and obviously pick the brains of Rob as well. I hope you've enjoyed that video. I'm heading back now to the caravan behind me, brought the family down. We're going to head out onto the beach and enjoy the rest of the day down here at Perrinporth. Don't forget if you are new to the channel, hit that subscribe button and make sure you put Perrinporth on your list to come and play at some point this year. Ready? Go. I had a feeling, but the feeling is all gone.